Hello and welcome to my studio in the Highlands of Scotland and this very special reveal of my Masterworks oil painting which was created specifically for the book jacket of Webstrand the Tooth Gatherer, part of Paul Taggart's Elfin Chronicles. When I created the Masterworks oil paintings which go into Webstrand the Tooth Gatherer, I had no idea that this particular painting would be created at all. It wasn't until Sunita Gahir, who is our design director, began working on the book jacket that she suggested to me that it would be really nice if the book jacket contained the whole trip across the surface of the planet Shemistra, which is the elephant's homeworld. At first, I really didn't know how this would work. But, as usual, I got out a pencil and a piece of paper and started to work it out. There were several challenges along the way, involved with the fact that this was a book jacket and that it had to spread the story from the elf and leaving the Starway all the way to their home nest on Shemistra. So let's move on now to the complete reveal of the whole painting in which you see all of the stages of the painting from start to finish, accompanied by the wonderful music of Lisa Mulholland, composed exclusively for our video storybook edition of Webstrand the Tooth Gatherer. Welcome to our artist's first edition video storybook. We invite you to listen along with me as I personally read through my unabridged original story. Webstrand, the Tooth Gatherer, available as a box set containing all nine chapters for streaming on Patreon and Vimeo. Let me take you now to the drawings that I started with and I'll take you through the whole journey. Here are my first scribbled drawings. You can see the challenges straight away. The whole picture had to be broken into four. If you imagine this as a book jacket itself, this would be the central spine. This would be the front cover this a flap which goes inside the front cover, this the back cover, and this the flap which goes inside the back cover. Each of those had to be incorporated in the total landscape. But as I began to create 
more and more of the drawings and get the idea of how the thing was going to work, I realized that not only did they have to make a complete picture, but also that each of these had to work in its own right, especially the front cover. And the front cover would have to have Webstrand herself. So as I moved through these elements, these ideas started to percolate. And I started to think, if this was a journey over Shemistra, the elfin themselves could carry us through the picture to the elfin nest on the left-hand side. It had to work from right to left because of the front cover. So I wanted to start on the right-hand side with the starway opening. And in the, uh, the starway opening on Shemistra is held in the hands of a guardian. And so on these first three drawings, you can see I'm trying to incorporate the Guardian, but I started to realize that that would be too much of a domineering element in the painting. And really it was the Elfin themselves, it was the Starway. And so the, I decided really that it was just the entrance to the Starway itself, which is held in place by this ball of plasma, this ball of energy. So, I got to this point where the starway itself was just going to be depicted by this sphere of light. The elfin were going to come out and they were going to move across to the elfin nest on the left hand side. So I then started to draw this up on a, on a slightly larger scale. Let me take you to that now, which is the drawing beneath. Here you see the final drawing with a trace laid over the top and it gives you some idea of how the picture is going to be broken up when the, the picture is in fact folded as the front cover. You'll also see on this tracing how the drawing underneath, which you can just see through the tracing, we'll lift the tracing off in a moment, but you'll see how the original drawing is already being changed as the tracing goes over the top to make these shapes work better within the rectangle, for example. So the initial wing here is smaller and on the actual trace, I made it larger to fit into the rectangle so that each of these rectangles works within its own right. I also had to incorporate what's known as the bleed. This is the area which you're likely to lose as the, as the image is printed. Uh, onto, onto paper. And you will also notice that these lines, while they show the rectangle, they also present the folds. And those folds, had, it, was, it was really important that they didn't go through important elements of the picture. So here you can see it cuts through the moon of Shemistra, but it doesn't hit either the wing here or the starway and you can see that all the way through again we go through if you like an unimportant part of the composition so in each case the composition is very much dictated on how the painting will look on the book jacket and how the folds will work and how every element of this every rectangle here must be a painting in its own right but specifically that front cover and when I was creating the front cover, I was also thinking about a title, where a title might then fit here, because we wanted to have Webstrand the Tooth Gatherer, Elf and Chronicles. So I also had to think about those, and yet at the same time, create an image which worked without those, without that lettering in. So there was all sorts of restrictions, which in a way were tremendous challenges in terms of the composition. So I will now lift this off and you can see the original drawing uh, before I started to change it a little bit for the book jacket itself. So here we are with the original drawing uh, beneath the overlay and you can see how it varies from the overlay itself. For example, the Elf and Swarm, which eventually move right across the, the painting, are actually missing here. That only became apparent, as I say, when I put the overlay on. But you have the various elements of the journey here. 
we have the three moons of Shemistra, we have the volcano, uh, and in the centre we have various plants and flora and fauna, if you like, of the planet itself. And then on the left-hand side we have the nest. But while we have all of the elements in place, obviously when that moves up into the painting itself, that begins to change. I'm going to walk you around this painting and fly you across the surface of Shemistra, as it were. But before I do, bear in mind that you can see every element of this painting, from the first drawing out right through the end of painting and onward onto the finishing glazes of the painting in our Watch and Wonder box set. So do have a look at the trailer for that. Now let's go to the finished painting itself and we'll take a trip across Shemistra. Because this is a book jacket, the challenge was to start from the right hand side and move across. And so I started the starway at the bottom right hand corner and you can see the elephant in fact emerging from it. It's held within a ball of plasma. Inside that ball are all the destinations that the starway can in fact take you to. And so the ball of plasma is full of galaxies. And out of that come the Alphan themselves. The blue lines of force which line the, the, the starway itself then come out of the starway and form a sort of misty tunnel through which the Alphan is still flying. Behind them, you can see a suggestion of the green magma lake. This plays an incredibly important part in the story. Every element of the story is, is, is somewhere in this painting, but some are more obvious than others. So we move with the elephant up, and in the sky there, you see two moons of Shemistra. The moons are quite different from each other, almost like different planets while they're catching light very much on the left hand side. The surface of those moons are different in each case. And so you need to look really deeply into that surface to see those differences and changes. Some have craters, some have striations, and some are made of different sorts of rock. Around them, you will see a myriad of stars. These were quite interesting to paint because each star needs to glimmer against the dark backdrop of the heavens. And to create that, it needed a misty halo. The misty halo is created first, that in the center of that, the star is then placed as a tiny little bright highlight. But as the bright highlight goes into the center, the mist appears to disappear. It's a strange phenomena, and you really have to see it for yourself. But it was almost, as I painted them, as I moved across the surface, it was almost as if I was turning the light out. But the light is there because of that mist. It is a really strange phenomenon. Do go and have a look at it. The elephant then move across the whole painting. But as you can see, they're all coloured differently and I had to consider the light that was falling on them. I also had to consider the light that their own jewels create on both their wings and on themselves. And I also wanted to position each one with the, the wings in a different position. So I had to think about that and the spaces between the alpha. It's so easy in a situation like this to place the alpha space exactly the same. So I had to think about the spaces between, and this is called the negative space around, around objects, and that is really important because if that becomes too regular, then we don't get a feeling of flight. Let's move to Webstrand herself. She is covered in gems, and she has this transparent skirt, as it were, which is made of spider's web, and her wings are transparent. This took quite a while to build up in layers of paint and in layers of glaze. 
And once again, if you see the whole process, you will see that not only does this take some time, but also the pose changed slightly. Her arms move around considerably as I decide how they'll best hold the garments and how they will best reflect the light. But again, I always think that painting is a process of development rather than knowing exactly what's going to happen right at the start of the painting. Below her, you will see a moonlit scene which is full of snatchthorn trees which can grab at a passerby. The light from the moon just dapples across those and on the fungoids which cover the forest floor as it were. And again, it wasn't something which was absolutely in my mind from, from the beginning. It's something which is created as you move into the painting almost mentally you become part of the painting. Many times Eileen has said that when she is working in the studio with me there's a certain silence which falls and she knows at that point that I'm inside the painting and that is absolutely true. I felt I was certainly inside that moonlit forest walking through there and therefore I could feel where the light would fall dapple across the forest floor and dapple across all the various plants that were there. The volcano is called Arctura and was one of the most enjoyable parts of the painting to create. Those areas of magma rolling down its surface and those sparkling highlights of yellow as the magma explodes and splutters against the dark night sky. Above them, these really dark clouds. One of the most difficult areas of the painting, right across the surface, because they're so dark and they're very close to the value of the sky. So to make them stand out against the sky and yet still be soft was quite a challenge. Again, if you see me creating this painting in our box set, you'll see how much their shape and quality changes all the way through. They're lit from above by the stars. They're lit by the lightning which forks between them. And they're lit from below by the volcano. So all of those elements had to be balanced against one another. But most importantly, they had to stand in front of that distant sky. It helped a little that they were warm in colour, although very, very dark, against that really intense deep blue of the night sky behind them. But still, incredibly difficult to balance. And they do form again a backdrop against which the flying elfin sweep as they move across the top of the painting towards the nest. Below Arctura and to the left, you'll see some rather strange vase-like objects catching the light. And they're very soft and they're made of spider's web because that's exactly what they are. They're the empty shells of spider's eggs. The spiders are known as rachnids and they form an important part of this story and of other Elfin Chronicle books. I didn't want to put the arachnids in here, I just wanted to suggest them. Behind them you see two orbs. These are the seeds of the astroplast plant. The astroplast plants are actually to the right of the volcano. They again are important in the story because they're used by the Elfin to lift heavy objects. They're full of astroplasm and they give the elfin the ability to lift an object which is known as the cradle. I'll not go into that in any more detail. You have to read the story. I won't give away any of the secrets because it will spoil it for you. We are now very close to the elfin nest. You can see the swarm of elfin sweeping down towards its entrance at the base. The green light that's emanating from that is created by the elfin crystals inside. And as you can see, the elfin nest is poised on the edge of an abyss. Again, an important part of the story. The elfin nest towers into the sky and the light seeps out of it 
seeps out of those individual pods in which the Alphen live. Behind the nest is the final Shemistran moon, one of the three. The Alphen have arrived at their home and we are ready to start the adventure but of course there is much more to Sumistra and much, much more about the Alphen and the tales that to be told there. Especially of Fizz and Webstrand, the Tooth Gatherer. Welcome to my studio in the Highlands of Scotland. From where we bring you Paul Taggart's Elfin Chronicles. As a young child, I was a very solitary individual. I loved to play on my own, especially in my grandmother's garden. Part of the garden was cultivated, but the most of it was wild and I loved walking through the long grasses and weeds and flowers that grew there. I remember those summer days chasing butterflies and searching for insects and frogs under stones and logs. At the bottom of this garden, the very bottom of the garden, there was a small rise and once I was beyond this small rise I was hidden from my grandmother back in the house. Just at the bottom of the rise was a small area of different grasses. The large grasses diminished and here was a swathe of fine green grass and it grew in a perfect circle. And I remember one day with the sun on my eyelids as I sat on that rise looking down on that grassy area, just closing my eyes for a moment and reopening them, there was a movement and I recognised it as a blue butterfly. I know there are blue butterflies everywhere, but there weren't any in my grandmother's garden. I knew that because I'd chased many a butterfly. There were cabbage whites, there were tortoise shells, red admirals, but I'd never seen a blue one there. So I was fascinated by it, but as I tried to focus my eyes on it, it disappeared. So I closed my eyes again and opened them just slightly and the blue butterfly came back. And I thought this was incredibly strange. So I kept my eyes half closed, pretending I was asleep. And I watched this butterfly flutter around and it was soon joined by another and then another. And they began to fly in a circle a clockwise circle around this green swathe of grass. You may say, well, you're probably asleep. I had, after all, closed my eyes. But this was not the only occasion it happened. After that time, I, I went down to that spot again and again throughout the summer, and the blue butterflies came back. And soon, I became absolutely entranced by their magic. As an adult, I always wanted to capture the essence of this magic, which is how, in the mid-90s, I found myself bringing to life the mysterious creatures that are the Elfin. During the light of day, I would take up my brush and watercolour paints to work on a set of 18 unique illustrations that were enchanting me. As I painted, I became so engrossed that all other paintings and books were forsaken in order to free my imagination and allow me to concentrate on completing my first book in the Elfin Chronicles, in which I recount a particular legend involving the Elfin swarm leader 
lace wing and an itinerant artist by the name of Artemis Glynn. However, it had always been my hope to set aside enough time to work on a collection of oil paintings with which to depict another significant event in Elfin history. We invite you to join me as I share with you my latest illustrated book from Paul Taggart's Elfin Chronicles. Webstrand, the Tooth Gatherer. Fast forward a few years later, and once more, the lure of the Elfin was too great to resist. I began work on another unique collection of masterworks oil paintings, which were to take me well over five years to create. As before, the elfin folklore of Webstrand the Tooth Gatherer took over my life. As I worked on these all important masterworks. The composition for each elfin portrait and scene setting painting was originally based on my first draft of the narrative. Soon, however, I found myself changing the interpretation of the story within these paintings as the world of Webstrand the Tooth Gatherer took hold. Ultimately, the developing paintings had an ever-changing influence on the story. Until both my paintings and story reached a natural conclusion. But this was merely the completion of the first stage. We were now about to embark on the next exciting phase, for the book had to be designed. We had a million ideas to explore. Why not some dedicated elfin music? At the very least, the elfin song, which comes into the story. Our wish list was growing as we added special items. The studio was filling with examples of uniquely produced work by talented craftspeople. What if we filmed the work in progress to share online so that people could peek behind the scenes at the various creative processes? And how about something else which is a little bit different, something unique to us? A new concept, something that reflects the work we've been doing online for many years. An illustrated audio book, maybe. What about something more than that? We all live in a world of skepticism, disbelief and doubt. But imagine, if you will, one filled with mystery and magic. Here, wishes can actually come true in a way you would hardly believe. Let me share with you the chronicle of an earthling who goes by the nickname Fizz, whose creative imagination and zest for life leads her on a remarkable journey. A journey which was to change her life forever. 
on which her guide was none other than Webstrand the Tooth Gatherer. Watch as I depict the story of Webstrand the Tooth Gatherer. Through my scene setting, original Masterworks oil paintings. And the many storytelling illustrations that capture this epic tale. And listen as this chronicle of a wondrous journey is told. Well spotted, Fizz, Webstrand congratulated. Yes, it is an eye gem, but the flash doesn't develop until it's linked to its own special wearer. Owning an eye ring isn't just like wearing a piece of jewellery. It becomes the wearer's companion and can't be used by anyone else. And listen to the original musical soundtrack and soundscape that undulates through the good times and bad, the joy and horrors, the magical and real. If, like Fizz, you also come to believe in Elfin and search carefully along a star's path, you may find what appears to be a small glowing ember in the undergrowth. But be on your guard, for once you start the search, it can soon become a quest. Welcome to our artist's first edition video storybook, created, filmed, and produced by us in our own studio here in the Highlands of Scotland. We invite you to listen along with me as I personally read through my unabridged original story, Webstrand the Tooth Gatherer, available as a box set containing all nine chapters for streaming on Patreon and Vimeo accompanied not only by Lisa's evocative music, which wends its way through the entire nine chapters, but also by my 20 masterworks, and the 116 vignettes, which are brought to life as I read from the pages of this video storybook. In the telling of the wondrous journey and epic tale that is the elfin folklore Webstrand the Tooth Gatherer. This unique concept of our video storybook was inspired by the artistic interpretations of my original story and paintings by our fellow collaborators. Both Sunita in her captivating book design and our music director Lisa Mulholland in her exclusive compositions reflect the mood of the story as it unfolds from light beginnings through more challenging times. The swarm kept to the wing, swirling in colours all around her she realized why. They were calling their farewells. But this was more than a call. It was a song. Although she understood not a word, its meanings were unmistakable. It was a song of friendship, of things done together, and of things yet to come. Faster, moved the kaleidoscope of colourful wing, and then 
On a rush of air, the swarm re-entered the corridor as one. And was gone. Time seemed to retrace its steps. Here was the same fizz as before. Well, perhaps a little changed. Sitting on our bed in the gloom of the same night on which they had left.